class, we discovered that Bristol was central to the British slave trade. To deepen our academic perspective, we focused on three readings, proving to be key guides in our discussion into theories of rejecting past and questioning how and why societies like Bristol struggle acknowledging and reflecting on their pasts. Supporting our argument that the British, including Bristol, reject their past by leaving information out and displacing and distorting their history. Dresser examined a 1954 bank advertisement featuring John and Sebastian Cabot, pointing out the little recognition of the slave trade's existence and their link to it, acknowledging that attempts to hide the city's slaving past were typical of the time. Caput argued that Bristol's population displaces their history rather than confronting it, highlighting that the use of the word trade conceals colonial violence by substituting it with a productive and positive practice, allowing the council to detach their problematic past while celebrating its victories. Historians such as Catherine Hall recognise that academically, Britain's past has been separated into British history and colonial history, spatially separating slavery from other histories from historical sites rather than incorporating them to reflect a full accurate story. As quoted, the trouble with the English is that their history happened overseas so they don't know what it means. This has guided public memory to be incomplete. Our group discussions were now focusing on social norms and perceptions of historical relationships to the present and how modern populations imagine histories. From the readings we focused on how memorialization was incorporated in Bristol's architecture and we were curious about what memorializations we could find other than the ones we discovered through readings and class activities when exploring Bristol. We wanted to investigate the locality to find physical evidence of the past. We discovered that 85% of the University of Bristol was funded by slave traders and has many buildings named and memorialized after slave traders. We were curious if this contributed to create a good image or if the university recognized the other aspects of their history. This led us to the research question, how did slavery impact the architecture and memorialization in Bristol? Through architecture, we believe it is possible to follow the money, investments, and philanthropist actions of slave traders to uncover the histories of Bristol that are hidden in plain sight. We wanted to explore how Bristol was addressing their history while dealing with changing social norms on their controversial histories. We went up to College Green, which led us into our first exploration in our rabbit hole, where we found artistic depictions of the slave trade on orbs outside Bristol City Council building. These included slave traders such as Edward Colston, but also showed the explorations of the explorer John Cabot. They were illustrating the ways in which Bristol City Council were funding artwork done by local Bristolian artists to show awareness of the colonial history and legacy still in Bristol today. From College Green, we continued to walk to Brandon Hill Park, looking closely at the buildings, where we saw that many university buildings had been funded by slave trade families. Once we reached Cabot Tower, we looked closely at it. The tower itself was built over 400 years after John Cabot sailed on the ship the Matthew in 1497 and found North America. The architect of the tower was William Van Gogh, who also designed Brist Bristol's Colston Girls School, named after the slave trader Edward Colston. The tower cost over £3,250 to build in the 1890s and was completed in 1898. This money today would equate to over £300,000, showing the significance of Cabot's legacy in Bristol and in some ways a memorialisation of Cabot and his family. John Cabot lived from 1450 to 1498 and was a Bristolian explorer who set out to discover Asia but instead came across North America, specifically Canada, and claimed it for England. His explorations, however, led to the slaughtering and kidnapping of Native American tribes. However, it was the son of John Cabot, Sebastian, Sebastian Cabot, who was a key founder in the idea of using Bristol ports for slave trading before Bristol was granted the right to slave trading in 1698. Sebastian Cabot had many slaves himself in his household, at an estimated 70 African and indigenous American slaves that he had brought from the Portuguese in Brazil in 1530. Within the tower, we found graffiti of Cabot's Next, which is in relation to the Colston statue coming down in 2020 Black Lives Matter protests in Bristol. This led us to continue our line of inquiry further within to our rabbit hole to discover and explore how the buildings around around Bristol, and specifically the University of Bristol, memorialise slavery and potentially don't confront the colonial history. We refined our search to inquire, how has the University of Bristol confronted its colonial legacies through the institution's buildings? This would allow us to explore features of architecture and memorialisation that relate to forced labour. In Bristol, by gathering evidence of colonial influence into the university's buildings, we would then be able to assess whether the university had attempted to confront or conceal its slave trade links. We realised that our rabbit hole was particularly relevant as the University of Bristol opened an online consultation this November named Research, Review, Renew, your views about university building names. This gives members of the public and students a chance to express opinions on the names of buildings and suggest new ones. It identifies a philanthropic support from families directly involved in the slave trade and is making investigations in order to develop the next course of action. Additionally, the anti-racism steering group was created in July 2020 after the toppling of the Colston statue with the aim of addressing the names of specific buildings with links to the slave trade, including the Fry Building, Merchant Ventures Building and Gordney Hall. In several attempts to rename the Wills Building, this attempt in 2017 got lots of media attention. It was led by Bristol professor Richard Stone, who specialises in the slave trade. Parallel to this, a 
counter petition arose, arguing that renaming the building would simply erase history instead of trying to confront it. However, comments on the petition show people's reasons for signing contained significant racism, dismissing the slave trade altogether. No further action was taken by the university following these events. We can see from this that the Wills building is the most controversial, potentially because they donated the most money to the university and physically are memorialised the most. We found that the authority of the Wills family within the university almost presents them as untouchable, as nothing has been done to counteract their influence so far, which is why we want to, wanted to investigate it further. The review also includes the confrontation of the crest of the university, which arguably is the most significant memorialisation of the families involved in the slave trade. It is the single most identifiable image that represents the university, and its links to slavery are very explicitly presented. Whilst walking around Bristol, a lines of inquiry began to develop around the Wills Memorial Building and its relation to the transatlantic slave trade. Focusing on memorialisation, we questioned how the architecture provided evidence of slave trade ties to the university and whether this demonstrated either confrontation or concealment of colonial ties. We tried to assess how accessible this information was to the general public and explicitly how these links were displayed. We also questioned if the physical location of the building was important. We knew before we visited Bristol that the Wills Memorial Building was opened in 1925 in memory of Henry Wills Overton III, the first Chancellor of the University of Bristol. He was involved in the slave trade, importing tobacco from the USA to fund the Wills family business, the Imperial Tobacco Company. The company accounted for 72% of the tobacco industry by the 1920s. His son, George and Henry Wills, paid for the building through the company's money. This company exists today under the name of Imperial Brands, highlighting that the Wills family legacy remains, making it even more important to research how the University of Bristol confronted its ties with the Wills family. We visited the Wills Memorial Building to see if there was acknowledgement of the university's links with colonial legacy ties. Located on Queen's Road, the building has a strong presence within the city, serving as a constant reminder to those who know of its colonial links. Located in the foyer, we noticed official plaques documenting the lead donors and funders of the building. The location of the plaques was revealing, as these were the only accessible source of relevant information without paying an admission fee or going on a tour. This meant that access to additional information associated with colonial legacies was limited. Therefore, by only giving partial access to the building's history, it could be interpreted that the university is reluctant to showcase its past in its entirety. The language used on the plaques is ambiguous. The plaques recognise and are grateful for the funding from slave traders and associated donors. This suggests that the university is appreciative and to an extent complacent with its colonial history. The donors are described as philanthropic, which could suggest that the university is attempting to whitewash the legacy of the colonial funders, embracing their generosity of donation and downplaying their involvement in the slave trade. The language seemed to change over time, with the plaque dated 1909 recognising donations and the later plaques in 1950 using the word grateful. This could show that the university has shifted its attitude towards its historical links, using time as a way to distance itself from the negative associations of its colonial past. We concluded that whilst the university is not denying its colonial past, it clearly does not condemn it. We recognised that we went to the building knowing that many donors were slave traders. However, for anybody reading the plaques without this prior knowledge, you could easily be unaware of the university's relation to the slave trade. Things we identified included how we saw a recent proactivity of the university to address their links to slavery. We thought this might be a result of the recent Black Lives Matter movement and the removal of the Colston statue, and considered why the Will's name wasn't as provocative and was more protected than Colston or other families. Going forward, we be interested in the outcome of the survey and review of whether any of the buildings actually did make progress in changing their names and what would they change to. The Colston statue was so symbolically torn down but why do these buildings still remain with their slave trade linked names? Other memorialised buildings up for renaming in the review include Goldney Hall which was bought by Thomas Goldney in 1756 and later owned by Lewis Fry who can be linked back to the slave trade. It was sold off to the university in the 1950s. Also, the Merchant Ventures building was named in 1996 after the Merchant Ventures Society due to their long-standing connection with the university's engineering department, who funded Cabot's voyage to Canada and Cabot was an active member of the transatlantic slave trade. The notorious Colston was always also a member of the society in 1896, and the society had a role in blocking the Colston statue's removal before it was pulled down by protesters in 2020. In August 2021, Colston Street Halls was renamed to Accommodation 33 in an effort from the university to become an anti-racist organisation, showing some evidence of the university listening to calls to rename the building. Theoretically, in order to answer how the university's memorialisation has addressed its colonial past, there is further research we could undertake. We could take a paid tour of the Wills Memorial Building to gain access to more information which may potentially link the university to the slave trade. We could also try to visit other buildings owned by the university to see if other architecture has acknowledged colonial pasts in a similar way. We could also conduct interviews on the general public to gather their views of the plaques within the Wills Memorial Building. 
to determine if people are making the link between the donors and the slave trade.